Hello and welcome to this film which is all about the D block elements. Um, it's the let's see it's the third in a series of five films about high level periodicity and hopefully by the end of this film you'll know some common properties of the transition metals you'll understand that there is actually a difference between the two terms D block element and transition metal and hopefully we'll understand what that difference is and um, you'll also be able to write electron configurations for the atoms and ions of these elements although that is in some ways a bit of a, a bit of a review of what was done earlier in the bonding topic. So here we are. Let's just uh, highlight on the periodic table which elements it is that we're going to be talking about in this film. As I say, uh, the terms D block and transition metals are not terms with exactly the same meaning. They're often used interchangeably, but they shouldn't be really. But we'll leave that aside just for now, we'll come back to it later, and we'll just point out the fact that we are talking about this set of elements here in the middle. The D block elements, that is to say the elements whose highest energy occupied orbital is in a D subshell. And if we think about what we need to know about these elements, well we're going to start off by saying uh, something about their ability to act as catalysts and the fact that they have variable oxidation numbers or in other words can have different charged ions kind of although that's a slight oversimplification and then because uh, these two things are basically just factual I've said that their difficulty is a little bit less than that of these two things here where we start looking at what complex ions are how they form and how it is that compounds of transition metals can end up being colored so that's actually going to be covered in the next couple of films so let's move on and have a look at how it is these things act as catalysts unfortunately there are some specific examples which just have to be committed to memory like manganese dioxide which is used to uh, decompose hydrogen peroxide. There's iron in the harbour process and vanadium pentoxide in the contact process, although you will be quite familiar with those by the time you've done the equilibrium topic. There's nickel in the hydrogenation of alkenes, which again, that's something that comes up in another topic, in fact, in the organic topic. And then there's cobalt in um, vitamin B12 synthesis in your body and palladium and platinum in catalytic converters in cars which some of you may be already be familiar with just because you've come across them in everyday life. As far as how these things work we don't really have to go into a lot of detail but what we do need to know is that a catalyst will reduce the activation energy of a reaction or at least it will provide an alternative pathway for the reaction to take place um, and then that pathway will have a lower activation energy than an uncatalyzed pathway and there is a subtle difference between saying that the uh, the activation energy is decreased than saying what we've just said but for now let's just leave it at that and say that if particles are going to be colliding and reacting um, if a catalyst can cause the uh, energy required for a reaction to fall then it's more likely that a reaction will happen now, this should be a little bit of a reminder. Um, we've talked before in the atomic structure topic about the uh, building up of electrons in orbitals. And we've mentioned before that the 4s and 3d subshells are very close together in energy and that they can change depending on whether there's electrons in them or not. And this is really quite relevant because, again, we're looking at d block elements, so elements with electrons in their d subshell as their highest occupied orbitals. So as you might remember we fill low orbitals first and empty the low orbitals last. Now uh, chromium is element 24 so I'd be able to put in, um, let me see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 electrons there. Then we start filling the third shell with another 8 electrons so we're now up to 18. If we put two electrons in 4s, we'll end up with uh, 20 electrons and we'd have four left to put in 3d. But remember that chromium is one of these elements that prefers to have unpaired electrons everywhere and it can avoid pairing up in 4s because 3d is so close in energy. So there is the electron configuration of a chromium atom. Now if chromium 
three plus, or if a chromium atom loses three electrons to become chromium three plus, which electrons will it lose? Well, remember that the three d orbitals are now lower in energy than 4s. So it's always the 4s electrons that get lost first. So chromium will lose that electron and two of these and it will end up with an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. All the 4s orbitals gone, uh, electrons gone and we're left with 3d3. Okay. Let's have a look at zinc 2 plus. Zinc is element number 30. So instead of having just 24 electrons, it would also have electrons there, 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 and there. In other words, it's D subshell, 3D subshell is completely full. If it lost two electrons, it would lose these two electrons here first in 4s, because remember they are now at a higher energy than 3D now that these orbitals are filled. And so zinc. 2 plus ions would have an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, and then finally 3d10. And in fact, it's very unusual to see ions with um, any s, 4s electrons when we're going across this first row of the D block. That was a little bit of a reminder. Now we're going to start looking at the uh, at something which really we won't understand fully oxidation states until we do the redox topic. But it, uh, I'll just present this as a as a series of facts here, and that is to say that every D block element forms a two plus ion. But apart from that, you need to remember that there is a chromium three plus ion, which you may well come across because uh, I mean without having to remember it because it's on the data sheet in the uh, uh, standard reduction potentials table. There's these um, ions here, so chromium plus 6, man manganese plus 4, and manganese plus 7. Strictly speaking, these aren't really ions. They're just these metal atoms with a particular oxidation number within an ion quite often. But as I say, we'll understand those terms more when we do the redox topic. I've put these in a slightly different colour because they are, these will the um, compounds with these oxidation numbers will appear on the data sheet, but not as individual ions. Fe3 plus should be quite a well-known ion, and copper one copper also forms a one plus ion as well as its two plus. So just make sure you remember those ions. Now, when it comes to defining uh, transition metals and what they are and, and what D block elements are, there is a small difference between the two because although all transition metals are D block elements, not all D block elements are transition metals. And that lies, uh, well, the explanation for that lies in the definition of what a transition metal is. And that is to say it's an element that forms at least one stable ion with partially filled D orbitals. Now, if we cast our minds back to what we we're saying about oxidation numbers, we will remember, hopefully, that zinc forms a 2 plus ion, but it doesn't form any others, and copper forms a 2 plus and a 1 plus. We've just looked at the electron configuration of zinc 2 plus, but it basically ended up with 3d10 at the end. So this is a stable ion, but there's no partially filled d orbitals here. They're all completely full. Copper 2 plus, which, which the atom ends in 4s1 3d10. Copper 2 plus would lose this electron and one of these, so it would end up with no s, no 4s electrons and 3d9. Now copper 2 plus is a stable ion and it does have a partially filled d orbital. Copper 1 plus on the other hand, which also copper, is also based on a copper atom I suppose you could say, only loses this electron here and ends up with 3d10. So although copper 1 plus could not be called uh, well electron transitions which we'll see uh, about shortly in, in the next film, uh, th they can't take place within the d subshell of copper 1 plus because copper does form at least one ion where there are partially filled d orbitals we can call copper a transition metal we can't call zinc a transition metal even though they are both d block elements got a little bit tongue-tied in that one so hopefully it's clear but hopefully now you understand 
um, that there are certain common properties of transition metals which we simply have to remember. We understand, hopefully, the difference between the terms d-block element and transition metal. And we've had a reminder of how we write electron configurations for d-block elements. There's some things which we've introduced in this film which will be coming up in future films. So might be worth watching them before you start wondering too much about some of the things that weren't really expanded on in this film. But if you've got any questions, comments or queries, then please feel free to come and see me or to post some comments on YouTube.